All right. Good morning. Good morning. We, uh, because of the weather, we'll probably just take a, a, a slow on-ramp to the service today. Um, everybody get their communion? Yes. We will participate with that together. Mm, 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 mm. Yes, I was giggling like of all, this week's been cold, but it feels like every time it snows, it's a Sunday morning, you know? We do. It has. And here's the other thing, what I am really grateful for is I didn't have to get there at 7, here at 7.30 to figure everything out, because uh, when it, we knew when it was really cold and it snowed, we had to turn the heat on a little bit early, and it's the nice thing about renting a space, so... Um, we are also in the process, my wife is, should be here any minute, uh, I don't know if you guys have this, I have a couple things that are on my checklist every morning to bring with me, and I forgot my iPad today, and so I'm scrambling, and so I'm just going to make it up, and we're going to go from there, I'm just kidding, I'm not going to make it up, so. <laughs> That's another way of saying it, yes. That's a much more uh, appropriate way of saying it. Oh my gosh, hello, hello, Aria. Um, okay, a uh, couple quick announcements. One, did you get my email? It was the anointed email, laid hands on my computer, prayed over it. Um, you should have like felt Holy Spirit immediately as soon as you opened it up. Um, with that being said, it was an email, first Wednesday, second Wednesday, third Wednesday of the month. Uh, if you did not get an email, you're not in a group, please let me know. I put people that I, the best I could. Um, we're, I'm really excited about these. I'm excited to see how it plays out. So uh, I, I loved the mix of the groups that it wasn't maybe people that you've hung out with before. And I thought, well, that's going to be fun because then we're going to get to get in the spirit together. And who knows what the Holy Spirit's going to do because he is sneaky and uh, he's awesome. So that being said, um, if, you have, if you have any questions about that, come talk to me afterwards. We'll get you set up with that. Uh, we just are excited about um, that space, that open time together, that time with no agenda other than to, to be together with him, with ourselves, and with each other, and just figuring it out, right? Uh, we were praying this morning and felt like uh, one of the things the Lord told me in my heart to pray was... Um, we don't know this is a new thing, right? And what I mean by that, I don't know if you've ever, maybe you have experiences I haven't had where if you've experienced a global pandemic and a national shutdown before in your life, uh, that's awesome. Um, but we've never had that before. And so there, it just feels like holistically as a, like think about this idea of global unity. For the, one of the first times in the history of my whole life, we are all together in this place. And for some of us, we're all together in anxiety. We're all together in I don't know what's coming next. Um, but there's a sense of unity in that. And I believe that the Lord will take uh, the worst hand of poker and he'll win. You know what I mean? And so I say that because I played poker Friday night and I did not win. So I'm believing that the Lord's going to redeem. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't get the lottery ticket. No. I'm struggling. So... Um, so yeah, so small groups will start February 3rd for the, if you're on the first Wednesday, it's February 3rd. If you're in the second Wednesday group, it's February 10th. If you're in the third Wednesday group, it's February 17th. Uh, the only other thing I want to offer is that we just want you, I know, uh, there's, we want to have very little pressure on you. So if it's a place where you go, man, that's, I'm just kind of navigating some things. We just trust you to do your own process and your own journey of going, oh, that's a sanctified pain where I know I need to be there and be a part of this. And or that's a, this is just maybe, I need to just take a couple weeks and, and not do this because I need, my schedule's already too packed. Does that make sense? We just want to have as little pressure as possible. Yes, may I have that? Thank you. Oh my gosh, you're the best. Hello, Bubba. Hi. Say Hi. So yes, that's, oh, 
We've got two beautiful babies. This is, yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, I say often I'm really grateful he looks a lot like his mom. Um, so, yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm just listening to Holy Spirit. He tends to throw audibles up here. Um, we were praying, and, and Brenda had gotten a word this morning about, uh, she used this language about writing, like no more writing down the inner tube. No more just writing and floating. It's time to dive in. And it felt, it resonated at a place, and it reminded me of this story I had told once here, but I had gone out a couple years ago. I had gone out to Colorado, and uh, my buddy is a firefighter in Denver, like Littleton, Denver area. And so I'd gone out there, him and his wife, and so he decides, all right, man, we're gonna go, we're gonna go tubing down the uh, Golden, in Golden, Colorado. So it's the creek, or it's the river that like Coors Light gets their water from, right? And uh, I, was, I, had, I had a beer joke and I decided not to say it. So that's <laughs> maturity coming out in me. And uh, <laughs> so um, I guess, yeah, they have these tubes. And so it's not a real rushing river, but it's, there's five or six places down this river where they have like a rock formation and uh, you go down these like, you know, the bumps, right? There's eddies and all that stuff. Um, well, then at every one of these, you have all these people that come and it kind of becomes a spectator event where you've got 30 people sitting on the side just watching people float down the river. It's kind of a really nice setting. So I go out there. I've never done this. I've floated on, like this is Indiana. I've floated on a flat river. You know what I mean? But I've never done this on just tubes. And so my buddy says, all right, there's three of us. He says, we're going to actually tie up to each other so we can float down together. And I'm thinking, yeah, what's the worst that can happen? I've got like my nice expensive sunglasses on and got a hat. And I'm, but it, it, we like have to hike like a mile up the river to be able to coat in. And I didn't bring any shoes. So my feet are getting fried in the, in, on the pavement. And so I, and I don't know if you guys know this. I'm not really the most outdoorsy guy. Give me a book of poetry and I'll sit inside and have a cup of coffee and let's talk through poetry, right? Because I'm real masculine like that. And uh, but so I'm huffing it with these two firefighters and these guys are jacked and I'm jacked right here, you know, and uh, walking up with this big old tube and we hook together and I start to float. Well, as soon as we hit that first rapid, I knew we were in trouble, <laughs> Because I'm going, ah, and I almost fall off. And so we get down to the third or the fourth one, and all of a sudden it feels like it's Niagara Falls. But I ended up, this is the one where we're in a triangle, and I ended up being the last one. So the, they go down it, and all of a sudden I go, and I, it's like slow motion, and I thought, words I'm not going to say right now. Oh, no, right? <laughs> so I go in the water, and... Uh, and so at that point, I go to like stand up, but there's all of these rocks underneath that are real slippery, so I can't get my footing. So now all of a sudden, the water's coming on top of me. The tubes are all on top. I can't get above the water. I'm worried about, these are nice sunglasses, so I got my hands here trying to get my sunglasses up. And then I didn't, I didn't know we were going to do this, so I didn't wear swim trunks, so I got shorts on. So I'm trying to get back up on the tube. My pants are down at my knees, and I... I look up and I am giving the, showing the world and there's 40 people sitting up here just watching me. It felt like 30 minutes of me trying to get back on this tube and uh, finally, like I'm like, oh, you know, I just enough to get up out of, the, out of the water and catch my breath and then I'd get dunked back again. And so my buddies are laughing so hard they can't help me. I have scraped the snot out of my knees and my shins I'm at that point where I'm so frustrated slash scared slash laughing, I'm crying. And I turn around and there's these old grandpas just like doing this. Thing. <laughs> and I finally get back on the tube and my, literally my pants are at my ankles, bare butt to the world. Um, and I thought, well, this, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and so my buddies go, let's do it again. I said, I'll wait down here. I will wait down here. And so I say that, so as Brenda was saying this prayer, this is the, prayer, this is the memory that's coming through my head. And uh, so as we begin today, I wanted to share this story. And, and, and one part of this, like, um, 
I think in some ways, as we have done church for many, many, many years, we've learned how to do it on a flat river. We've learned how to just kind of float in the tube and it's leisurely. I need you, we need to understand that from the beginning, when they wrote the scriptures, the Christian journey was never intended to like flesh out the leisure part of life. It was intended to be full of rapids. And how many of you guys know when I'm sitting you know, in a warm you know, room, it's easy to say, oh yeah, the rapids, that would be fun. It's a wholly different experience when you can't get your pants out of your ankles and people are watching you that are out of the whole arena and you feel stupid in how you're doing things, right? It's a whole different experience when, if I'm being honest, you feel naked and vulnerable. And so I use all that illustration to say, um, I, I believe it's a word for today, that the Lord is saying, oh, you've done so good in the leisurely float. My time for you is to jump in, though. To jump in in a new way, right? To jump in in a way that uh, we've never seen before. To jump in in a way that, uh, if we're really being honest, uh, can scare me because I'm more familiar with my limitations than I am maybe with what God's trying to do. You know what I mean? And so I want to say... I am, the, I am the king of having my backside shown to the world. <laughs> you know what I mean? I've got many, many testimonies of that. And so I think as long as we can, one, laugh at ourselves, but two, as long as we know that actually being in the river full of the rapids, as long as we know the presence is here with us, as long as we can laugh at ourselves, And as long as we can keep showing up to the table and saying, well, let me tell you where I showed my rear end this week. I think there's a grace on that for it to be, like I didn't need my buddies to say, well, this is how you fix that, Matt. I needed my buddies to laugh. Go, are you okay? Yeah. They're like, let's do it again. And so I say that to say this morning as we engage with this, I, I, I really want to gri- bring a caveat. As we're going through the, our value system, um, there's a distinction from going through, like having these truths and then trying to get to them in our soul. Does that make sense? Where like I say, oh, we value space. And there's a partnership that we're doing with the Lord. We value the journey or we value whatever these things is. They can be like soul things. But at the core, what we want to emphasize is that, no, 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 we are trying to find a language for what we believe the Spirit is leading his body into right now. So without the Spirit's leading on this, this just becomes a good discipline that we work through. And they're not bad disciplines. But we believe that we are in a season, a pregnant season, of the Spirit leading us into a place where we say, oh, we're recognizing our dependence is on his, on his, on his, or our dependence is on his presence. Our dependence isn't on me figuring out where I'm at in the journey. The grace on our lives right now is, is that the spirit is taking us into a journey that's cutting us open in, in ways I didn't know was possible. Does that make sense? So <clears throat> once again, I say this to say, uh, we want to emphasize Number one, that you have been designed from before the foundation of the world to hear his voice and to respond to his presence. Number two, uh, you hear his voice unlike anybody else in this room. That's the beauty of like the tapestry of the father's heart for, for, his, bride, for his son's bride. And so what can happen is, is when, when you're looking at, like I wanna hear like Matt or I wanna hear like him or her, it can sometimes invalidate the uniqueness of how you have been designed to hear. So what we want to do is create space for you to learn how to hear in the way that you've been designed to hear. And how many of you guys know, sometimes you think you hear something, you're not completely sure that you're hearing it right, right? Because if, if it was a burning bush moment, there's a place where I wouldn't need faith for that. I literally can see it happening. Many times I like sit with the Lord and I'm like, I think this is the Lord. And it's not for two, three, four weeks later when I've chosen to live into that without the fear of being wrong. I think this is your, your voice, Lord. 
that it's then it bears witness and I get affirmed, oh, that was his voice and here's why. Does that make sense? And so, but if I'm being honest, that only happens in community where we can flesh that out and work that out together. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Okay, so uh, all of that to say, this is my, that's my preamble to what our worship experience is going to be today, is we have found, uh, you guys remember, we've, we've used this language, Lectio Divinas, right? It's a Latin phrase meaning divine light, right? The reading of scripture. And so I, we're going to do that together, okay? Uh, there's a passage out of Hebrews that we're going to read, and I just felt like Jesus was on it. Hello, shalom. <laughs> and uh, good morning. So... So all of that to say, um, we're going to read this passage, and, and you guys know this if you've done, if you did the EHS class or anything like that, um, we believe that scripture is the doorway to his presence, one of the doorways. Does that make sense? That, that once again, we believe that this word is truth, it's alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, so this is the place. Scripture isn't necessarily, like, oh, you're going to get me preaching. There's a way that we can actually approach um, scripture, where we intellectualize it, right, for the purposes of understanding, and if I understand it, then I have a hold of it. But you guys know there's certain scriptures when you read them and they stand up and you get them intellectually, and you're like, why are they, why is it speaking to my heart? I don't understand this. It's because the Lord is trying to contextualize that scripture into your moment, into your season. We call that a rhema word that the Lagos is Genesis to Revelation. It's the full context of Scripture. It's beautiful and it's wonderful. It's what the Lord has given us to to anchor our our, our lives into. But here's the greater revelation, in my opinion, is that Jesus is the incarnate Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us in John 1.14, right? And so every time we read this, what we discover from the prophets on is that they were trying to describe what life in Christ looked like. And so as we use the word, it's about engaging not just your mind. It's about this place where my heart was made. My, like every part of me holistically was made to engage with his presence. And so then the word, right? I'm not transformed by the intellectually stimulating parts of the scripture that change the way I think. I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. And my mind gets renewed through my heart. My mind doesn't get renewed because I, oh, I learned this truth and now I can be more disciplined in it. My mind gets renewed when I begin to say, I'm going to be in faith in this. I I believe this is you, Lord, and I'm going to begin to walk this out, and I see him manifest what he's doing all around me. Now my mind can be transformed because I've holistically had an encounter with his presence. Does that make sense? So we believe that if we create space for us, for all of us to holistically to engage with his presence what we find is that transformation is the fruit of being in love. Transformation is not the demand from an angry father. Transformation is the fruit of the soil of being in love with him. That's what it is. Because I don't know about you, I believe, I fall in love, I get undone when I hear his voice, I hear his thoughts towards me. You care about this? Oh, this is actually what you think about me. Oh my gosh, this is the place that I carry with your heart. I get transformed when he invites me into that place and then I begin to walk in it because I trust his heart and now all of a sudden I see the world differently than I did 10 minutes ago. Does that make sense? And so here's the best part. I'm a pastor and I love to hear myself talk. If you've sat here at all, you know I love to hear myself talk. I think I have fun things to say. And Jesus has said, you say a lot of those things because you don't trust that my presence is here. I said, no, yes. And so we're just gonna create space. So here's how it's gonna go. There's gonna be three different readings of this text and just for you type A people, Hebrews 11, one through three, and then I'm gonna add verses eight through 10 in Hebrews 11. And then I'm gonna do 12, one through three. It's gonna become one unique passage together. Hebrews 11, one through three, eight through 10, 
and then 12, one through three. Does that make sense? Okay, and I'm gonna read it out of the Passion Translation because I think it's really fun to read it outside of the language that we've heard all growing up. So I'm gonna read it three different times. I'm gonna leave a minute of silence in between each time. Does that make sense? Let me sit, let me, I want you to hear why though. So in the first reading, right, I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit as he ministers God's word to you, right? There is a listening intellectually, but it's more about slowing down and connecting with our heart. We're gonna listen, and I want you to ask Holy Spirit as you're listening, will you highlight one phrase, one word, one phrase. Don't interpret it. Don't add any content. Don't add any teaching to it. None of your opinion. Just what's the word or phrase you want me to hear? Make sense? Okay, then I'm gonna get in that minute of silence after the first reading. I just ask, I just invite you to ask Holy Spirit. Now, here's the best part. If you don't hear anything, just rest. Just trust. Trust he's still talking, even if we're just learning to hear it, okay? I'm gonna read it again. And as you enter the second time into this passage, and I'll remind you during these moments of silence what we're doing, but I just want you to get an overall experience. Enter the passage. What emotions do you have? So you have the phrase, let's say. What emotions do you have? What personal struggle or longing in your life today is God speaking into? And I wanna invite you to be specific to your own journey, to your own heart. Okay, that's the second reading. Then we're gonna have a minute of silence and just, just sit with him and let him talk and just listen. If, if, as you wanna, if you wanna talk, go ahead, with, you know, talk within yourself. So after that second minute of silence, we're gonna go into the third reading of the text. And it's there, I wanna invite you that I believe the Lord, Jesus is gonna have a gift for you. And it's there I wanna invite you to begin to receive what Jesus has for you today. Like literally 2,000 years ago, he died that you would have something from him today, right? So what is, so I want you to ask the Lord, what is my personal invitation from you? What do you sense God might be saying to you? Does that make sense? Any questions on that? All right. So this passage in Hebrews 11 is talking about faith. And Abraham is our father of faith, right? Faith isn't about having the right answers. Faith is confidence in the character and the nature of God himself. Faith is being so convinced he is who he says he is. Abraham shows us that faith is a journey following an unseen God into a promised land. But that doesn't mean that faith is a blind leap in the dark. Biblical faith is based on knowledge, but it's spiritual knowledge. And that spiritual knowledge is rooted in the kingdom of God himself. So by faith, we step into the unknown, holding the hand of heaven, proceeding step by step and enduring to the end. So Holy Spirit, we just create space right now for you to lead us the next step in the journey we find ourselves on. So in this first reading, I invite your heart. Well, first let me say this, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would give our minds permission to be participants in this. And we call forward that deep place within each of us where our hearts are present. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would illuminate one word or one phrase in this text. Now faith brings our hopes into reality and it becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. This testimony of faith is what previous generations were were commended for. Faith empowers us to see that the universe was created and beautifully coordinated 
by the power of God's words. He spoke and the invisible realm gave birth to all that is seen. Faith motivated Abraham to obey God's call and leave the familiar to discover the territory he was destined to inherit from God. So he left with only a promise and without even knowing ahead of time where he was going, Abraham stepped out in faith. He lived by faith as an immigrant in his promised land as though it belonged to someone else. He journeyed through the land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, who were, pers- who were persuaded that they were also co-heirs of this same promise. His eyes of faith were set on the city with unshakable foundations, whose architect and builder is God himself. As for us, we have all of those great witnesses who encircled us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin we so easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon with passion and determination for the path has already been marked out before us. We look away from the natural realm and we fasten our gaze onto Jesus who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example is this. Because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his, He endured the agony of the cross. He conquered its humiliation. And now he sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. So consider carefully how Jesus faced such intense opposition from sinners who opposed their own souls so that you won't become worn down and cave in under life's pressures. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would illuminate a phrase, a word, a section. As we listen this second time, I want to give you permission to check in with your heart. What am I feeling? What specific situation in your life today relates? If you want to write down a prayer or just pray within your own heart, we just give you freedom. Now, faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. This testimony of faith is what previous generations were commended for. Faith empowers us to see that the universe was created and beautifully coordinated by the power of God's words. He spoke 
and the invisible realm gave birth to all that is seen. Faith motivated Abraham to obey God's call and leave the familiar to discover the territory he was destined to inherit from God. So he left with only a promise and without even knowing ahead of time where he was going. Abraham stepped out in faith. He lived by faith as an immigrant in his promised land as though it belonged to someone else. He journeyed through the land living in tents with Isaac and Jacob who were persuaded that they were also co-heirs of the same promise. His eyes of faith were set on the city with unshakable foundations whose architect and builder is God himself. As for us, we have all of those great witnesses who encircled us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin we so easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination. For the path is already marked out for us. We look away from the natural realm and we fasten our gaze onto Jesus who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example is this, because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his, he endured the agony of the cross, conquered its humiliation, and now he sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. So consider carefully how Jesus faced such intense opposition from sinners who opposed their own souls so that you won't become worn down and cave in under life's pressures. we enter this third time what is God's personal invitation to you from this scripture you can write down what the Lord may be saying or just pray a prayer of thanks or just simply rest in in the spirit's presence now faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It's all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. This testimony of faith is what previous generations were commended for. Faith empowers us to see that the universe was created and beautifully coordinated by the power of God's words. He spoke, and the invisible realm gave birth to all that is seen. 
faith motivated Abraham to obey God's call and leave the familiar to discover the territory he was destined to inherit from God. So he left with only a promise and without even knowing ahead of time where he was going. Abraham stepped out in faith. He lived by faith as an immigrant in his promised land, as though it belonged to someone else. He journeyed through the land of living in tents with Isaac and Jacob who were persuaded that they were also co-heirs of the same promise. His eyes of faith were set on the city with unshakable foundations whose architect and builder is God himself. As for us, we have all of those great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin we so easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination. For the path has already been marked out for us. We look away from the natural realm and we fasten our gaze onto Jesus who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example is this. Because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his, he endured the agony of the cross, he conquered its humiliation, and now sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. So consider carefully how Jesus faced such intense opposition from sinners who opposed their own souls so that you won't become worn down and cave in under life's pressures. Papa, what is your invitation for us today? That's my son. He is. He is. We just thank you, Lord, for the work of your son and what he did. We thank you that it's in him that all of life is found. And so we just step into and stand in a place of surrender and invite you, Holy Spirit, to just minister to our hearts today. It's in your name. Amen. Amen. How are we doing? Good. Not restful? I don't, maybe that's, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but... Yeah, and if you're at a place, and hear me on this, <clears throat> silence isn't always comfortable, right? I know sometimes if I'm not, uh, I'm in a, in a different space, sometimes I can like sit in silence and I'm like, oh, this is such glory. And other times, like my knees are like shaking and I'm like, all right, come on, Matt, you know, just come on, get going, get going, get going. And so uh, either place that you're there, we just want to invite you to... Um, yeah, to just be present with that. Come on, that's fun, isn't it? That's good stuff. It's funny, uh, we were talking today, and um, uh, I, uh, interestingly enough, it's cold outside, and uh, it's been cold all week, and uh, there's this, you guys know what, uh, I think they're called GIFs are? Uh, 
It's like you can send them on your phone. Like there's this one of Jack Nicholas, and he's like out in the cold and he's doing this like freezing and he's got icicles like all over his face. If I was more tech savvy, I would have it up here so you guys could see it and we could all laugh together. So let's pretend like, oh, that's funny, right? <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Now I feel more uh, safe. Okay. Um, I hate the cold. I, I love Jesus, but I hate the cold. Uh, often at this point in the year, I'm like, Jesus, if you ever need someone to go serve and minister in Southern California, uh, preferably in Orange County, uh, on a beach house, I would more than, than jump at that chance. The surfers need Jesus too. I will learn to surf for you. And uh, we were talking though, as we were processing it, <clears throat> I was reading, we were, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have used the language in the church only for like the last hundred years of, um, did you get saved? When did you get saved? That's a phrase that's only been around in the church for about a hundred years. Now, I don't know about you because I'll admit, maybe because uh, I'm an American, it's easy for me to go, well, that's just because all those other generations and cultures were stupid. We have it the rightest way, right? If it's not American, I don't want it. And uh, I say all of that to say jokingly that um, we have been journeying this together like, and, and, and our ideas of what salvation is have been framed really by the last hundred years of really since the Enlightenment of scholarship and everything else, which is interesting because I'm going to a place here. Before that, you know what they said? They used the language of salvation and they were asking the question, um, how is Jesus warming your heart again? That was the framework that they operated in and they understood much like out here in this cold, right? If, uh, uh, if as we, let's say we, we were out there and you're shivering and you're doing this whole thing, right? You put your jacket on, then you come inside and you get warmer. Well, let's say we start a fire out there and you get warmed by the fire. I think sometimes what we believe is that, oh, I got saved, now I'm in the warm house for the rest of my life. But in actuality, the reality is, is the culture, we are living outside. Does that make sense? So the thing is, is I get warmed up by the presence of God. Jesus in, introduces himself. I get warm. All of a sudden, oh my gosh, I begin to feel my appendages in ways I never felt them before. But sometimes I can begin to have a framework that says, well, now I'm good. I'm good for the rest of my life. Never understanding that the minute I step away from the fire, is the minute I get cold again and begin to assume, oh, this is what salvation is. You get warmed up and then you just have to live freezing until Jesus comes back, right? And, and the reality is, is most of us can say, oh, yeah, that's been some of my experience. And so they understood that, that it wasn't just I said a prayer. It was literally, no, 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 my heart got warmed up, but because I'm still living in a culture that's freezing, I know that I need to continually be warmed up. I have to keep letting my heart get warmed up. I actually, the more tender I am, because how many of you guys know that sometimes when your body gets really cold, what does it do? It shuts down the unnecessary things to keep just you surviving. And many times that is the practical example of what people in church are, is because I have forgotten what it's like to be warmed up by the presence of God, that I've literally gone into survival mode and people talk about life and life abundant. People talk about the gifts of the Spirit. They talk about the fruit of the Spirit being love and joy, right? Peace, patience. I don't get any of that. I'm in survival mode where I'm just trying to keep my heart ticking. I'm trying to keep my yes going to the Lord because I don't see any of that in my world. I love the framework that says salvation is about being warmed up and continuing to stay by that fire. Because what it does is it moves our responsibility away from, I said the right prayer, I believe the right things, right? And how many of you guys know, I can say I believe something, but it doesn't require anything of me. But the core of it is, is for my heart to continue to stay tender to the Lord, I have to be warmed up. Because so often what can happen is a counterfeit form of salvation is when I know all the right things to do because I grew up in the culture, but man, I'm frigid and I'm freezing and I'm in survival mode, so I'm doing just what I need to do because I don't have the bandwidth nor the energy for anything else. And the Lord completely is asking me, will you come get warmed up again? Because here's the tension. In, an, in, a, in a culture built on progress, the core is always, what are you producing for me? 
And when I'm in the culture and I'm freezing, I can begin to think, oh, that must be, right? Because I haven't felt the fire. That must be what God wants for me too. What are you producing for me? How are you ministering for me? How are you using your gifts and your talents? How are you using your, anointing? you get it? And then what happens is, is one, if I'm not convinced that I actually have those, I end up just living as a spectator, consuming. Or two, I begin to say, okay, well then I'm just gonna work, work, work. How many of you understand when you work, 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 it will always, it will always take you away from the fire. And suddenly I'm still doing all of the same things, working, 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 but my heart now is cold and really I'm working to avoid the bitterness of he doesn't love me like he loves somebody else. Then my eyesight is, well, he has blessed them, but he's not blessed me. He has given them something that he hasn't given. And suddenly my view is always lack. Does that make sense? So as we're processing this together, I want to, I want to speak to that place. Hey, Precious, if through the women's bathroom, that's where everybody's at. Okay. <laughs> So I say all of that to say we, we find ourselves in this place that's super fascinating where as we're journeying through this, this is the crazy thing to me is you can actually take revelation from the Lord. We value space. We value the journey and I can actually bounce up into my head and figure out how I understand that and now I can actually begin to live into that and walk that out. Where I don't actually need Holy Spirit to show me what space is. I don't need Holy Spirit to show me where I'm at in the journey. I can actually do it because I understand now the paradigm. I understand my parameters and I know how to perform in this culture. Does that make sense? And we can begin to adopt the language while we're shivering of those that are standing by the fire. And so I believe that there's a divine reset going on within the body of Christ where the Lord is saying, stop doing and stand by my fire. Let your body get warmed up. Let your heart get thawed again. And how many of you guys know, I'm gonna merge analogies here, that when your heart starts to get thawed, it gets painful. When your fingers are getting, they're getting life again, you're like, oh my gosh, it's painful. Your rear end is showing. <laughs> Come on. Maybe that's just my testimony. Thank you for letting me confess. That's the whole nature of what we're talking about here. The minute that order or control supersedes the journey is the minute that I will not let myself go through that pain because I need to understand it in order to go through it. And how many, like that's the whole passage. Abraham picked up and left. Not because he knew where he was going. He left because that's where God was at, right? So last week we talked about we value the journey and I used the illustration of Peter and we talked about this idea of the shadow world. I know none of you have shadows, only me. But it's this place where I'm simultaneously operating in Simon and Peter. I'm simultaneously operating in this place where I can have, maybe this is just, I have great faith to believe this over here on a Tuesday. And sometimes by Tuesday night, I'm in a place where I'm like, I don't believe that at all. <laughs> right? Right? I have faith, how about this one? I have faith if somebody comes up to me and they have terminal cancer, I have faith to believe for God to heal them. And yet, when I go home, I don't know if I have faith that the Lord's gonna stretch my pension out to like, make me survive financially. Does that make sense? It's these places of like, I can have faith for something over here, but I don't necessarily have faith because my shadow is pretty large here. And my shadow has been influenced by some wounds. And sometimes we get into a culture where we, we begin to learn the language of wholeness and the language of healing. And we want to be, we want to shortcut the journey and want to get through it and we want to get to the destination. So I can actually mimic the language of wholeness all the while never having my rear end show because I've been vulnerable. Never actually like pulling back the curtain and letting somebody into my mess. Never letting the pain let my fingers come alive again. Does this make sense? And Jesus the whole time says, why are you trying to go to the destination when I'm fully present in the journey? So we were talking right before service and um, as we were praying, I felt like the Lord showed me, uh, right? So we had talked a couple weeks ago about how, 
Oh, Jesus, thank you. Um, when we sit with the Father, man, their like, identity, like you get secure. You become solidified in who you are. That's what a father does, right? And this has been even my own journey with the Lord. Even the last couple of weeks, the Lord's been showing me, oh, here's part of your shadow, Matt. Like you, you've done such a beautiful job on this part of the journey. I'm taking you into this part of the journey. And then you feel like you don't know anything again, Right? He, he wrecks any destination theology that we have. We're like, I've arrived, come listen to me, right? It's a place where like, oh no, I'm taking the medicine again. Like, Lord, oh, I need, Papa, I, I, I'm insecure. I'm, I'm in a place where I don't know. I'm not, I don't know this language. I don't know how to navigate this. This is a new thing. I'm not confident in what I was once confident in. I learned how to perform in all these other places. I don't know how to do that here. I don't even fully understand what you're doing, right? And then I get frustrated because I can't excel if I don't understand and I can't do it right if I don't understand it. And this place where the father says, yeah, I need you to know I love you in that. And he never, he never tells me how to excel. He never tells me how to fix it. He never tells me how to be better, right? And I get so frustrated, you can't tell, but I get so frustrated and the father just goes, oh, I love you, right? I unconditionally love you. But there's also a conditional part of his love where he says, son, that's not for you. Why are you doing that, right? So I'm not just saying it's all just like warm and fuzzies. There's a deep place of resonance where he says, son, what are you doing? Get your head out of your rear end, right? So then this has been my experience, right, where I have the father... Oh, and then all of a sudden, I, and then Jesus starts to talk to me, and suddenly I start to do life in community with people. And I realize how much, well, I feel really powerful, and I feel really secure, and when I feel really secure, then I'm like, the, I am God's gift to everybody. <laughs> you need me to, I'll minister over you, I need me to pray for you, what do you need me to do? I'll do whatever you need me to do. And then Jesus says, hey, I need you to let them serve you. <laughs> Other than that, that's not me. And the shadow comes out because my theology is, is that I, when I go and I'm with the Lord, I know how to be servant. So let me just serve you. Let me just pour out my love to you. Let me just, right, let me just wash everybody else's feet and I'm disconnected from my own heart and my own needs. I have no idea what my heart even wants or desires. I find myself in a place of just completely being okay with ministering to everybody else. I'm gonna lose my life and I overdose on that. And then Jesus says, you know why you're bitter and frustrated and you have to take breaks every couple of weeks? You collapse and then you're like three days on the couch with have no energy for anything? Why? Because you won't let me minister to you. You won't let me serve you. You're approaching me just trying to serve me. And so what I have found is that any time there's a relational thing going on where I'm desiring something in relationship I always look and I, always be, I find myself always praying like, Jesus, you gotta show me how you did this. Because here's the reality, is that Jesus, th this is the revelation I felt like we got when we were praying. Jesus, if you look in the scriptures, Jesus didn't do signs and wonders to his disciples. I wanna pause on that. Jesus didn't go, Peter, this is going on, let me just give you a deliverance here. We don't have that in scripture necessarily. Jesus, or Peter, you twisted your ankle. Let me put my hands on it and heal it. Why? Because the moving of the Spirit is intended to, to push me out and minister out. But the ministry of Jesus is to learn how to sit at a table and love and be loved. The ministry of Jesus is he's saying, come sit at my table. Let me teach you how to do life with your fellow believers. Don't just minister to them. That's not your only role. Your role is to give and receive life. There's a mutuality that we have with Jesus that we don't have with the Spirit and the Father. The Spirit's our comfort. I, don't, I, I, I wanna be careful about my absolutes in, my, in this theology, but this is a paradigm that I'm trying to say, this is all part of the journey. Because then there's a place, what happens is, is that when I go out to a broken and a lost world, then I can really begin to, to rely on the Spirit who's help, who's empowering me to minister the love of the Father, the love of Jesus around the table in community to a broken and lost world 
who's frigid and freezing. It's me saying, let me tell you about this fire that's lit me up. I can do this and I can feel my hands, right? So we're trying to find an articulation in this language. This isn't for you to go spelunking and do soul work. This is what the Spirit has shown us is is language of where he's leading us. He prioritizes, hey, will you just sit with me and create space? And when I can sit with the Father and create space and I can be comfortable in that space, I begin to hear. Because isn't that what happened with Peter? Simon Peter has revelations of Jesus, has revelations from the Father when he has space to encounter him. That's the ministry of, like, that's what, this, that's what Jesus has, his blood is doing. It's literally like you were made in his image. He's leading you into an encounter with the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then he's saying that place of settledness, that place of oneness, that place of being together, of you knowing my story over you, and then on top of that, you being able to hear the story over somebody else, that is the place where we gather together and we sit in awe and wonder of God forming his bride. Does this make sense? And then there comes a place when we get really secure in that place where the Lord says, okay, I'm actually gonna have you go sit at the bar and begin to invite those that are frigid into the heat of my fire. But if I'm being honest, you know what happens? That sometimes I lose sight that these are actually led by the Spirit and I go into principle into these. I bounce into my head and because I have the revelation, I have the articulation and the information, I can begin to try and, I'm gonna use air quotes here, teach the deep things of the kingdom, but it's actually rooted in my desire to be something I'm not yet. I want to be in a destination that I'm not yet. Does this make sense? So there's this deep invitation to say, it's not about the destination. Nowhere in, nowhere in the history of the church has it been about us arriving at a destination of understanding that we now are the experts This is why we get, we're going to look at 1 Peter here in a second. We get to Peter himself. And Peter is like looking at people when he's 60, whatever, however old he is. He's arrived. And he says, I, I don't know. We're participants in the divine nature. I don't know. Little children just love one another as God has loved you. Because you guys know this, the closer you get to the destination, the more you realize, I don't have any of this figured out. And on my best days, hear me, I can, I can go, yeah, I don't have any of this figured out, and I'm okay with that. On my worst days, I hear everybody out here frigid and freezing going, well, I'm the rightest, this is what we should do. But they're not any warmer than I am, right? And the culture suddenly begins to inform I got a lot of competing voices in all of this. And the whole time, it's like the Lord isn't, he doesn't seem to be speaking to, this is how you fix it. He seems to be saying, will you come sit by the fire with me? And it frustrates me because I'm helpless. I have no power to control and to manipulate and to make things happen. I'm completely in a place of dependence on him moving. Maybe that's just me. So we find ourselves last week talking about this idea of the journey and how the sacredness of somebody else's journey, it's when I, many times, it's when I'm convinced that I know my own journey, insert laughter here, when I'm aware, like when I'm like, this is where I'm at in the journey, right? I'm in Jericho, it's only a couple more times and I'm gonna be in Jerusalem. It's when I'm convinced that I know where I'm at in my own journey that I try and pinpoint where you're at in yours. 
rather than just being a participant in your journey. And hear me on this, what I'm not saying, because I know this comes up because of how we've been trained. What I am not saying is that sin doesn't matter. That's not what I'm saying, right? There's a different way of approaching sin, though, when I'm led by the Spirit to say, child, can I talk to you about this? Because this is robbing you of your destiny and maintaining the dignity and honor of their autonomy with the Lord. That's different than me coming in saying, well, we need to address this sin and then I can be in relationship with you. Does this make sense? There's a place where we are in being invited to sit with people much like Jesus. I'm reading this book called uh, Contagious Holiness. Jesus' Meals with Sinners. And this place where like Jesus sat down with the prostitute. He wrecked gender paradigms and invited certain women to come and sit at his feet as disciples that wrecked the gender paradigms of thank God I'm not a woman. He was unafraid. But he also wasn't walking out just looking to correct everybody. And I mean this, God himself comes, sits with a woman, encounters her heart in a way where there's grace in a divine moment and then and only then when he has that kind of influence can say, child, go and sin no more. Does this make sense? You're gonna get me preaching, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, if you have your Bibles, let's go to 1 Peter. Clear as mud. So when we say we value space, we value the journey, once again, I want to offer that this is all illuminated by Holy Spirit. And so this is the part of it, right? This tender, sacred space where... um, and I hope you hear my heart. I have no interest in putting you into some type of discipleship procedure that we've mapped out. What I'm, what I'm not saying is that I do believe there's an order to what God does, right? But the way that you become aware of the order for someone else's life is you become very familiar with the order in your own life. Does this make sense? The more tender, like the more that my, I'm gonna use this analogy again, the more that I am warmed up by the fire and I can begin to feel my fingers, the more I can talk about somebody else feeling their fingers. Because I'm not talking about it from a distant memory. I'm not talking about it out of principle. I know God gave us fingers, we just haven't used them yet because I can't feel them. It's like, no, my heart has been so, and you guys ever had this moment where sometimes it did happen 40 years ago and you're sitting with somebody and the Lord says, and and you can hear their story and the Lord says, hey, remember this testimony? And you're like, yeah, I haven't thought about that in 30 years. The Lord says, I want you to tell that testimony. (gasps) Oh, you're actually bringing back a moment where my fingers were fully alive in that. Does that make sense? Because We've been faithful to do the journey with the Lord. We're keeping our heart tender. We're keeping our heart warmed up. Does that make sense? So once again, I know I'm preaching to the choir right now. But as we begin to proceed, I believe in my heart of hearts, it's about the Lord giving a language that we can be on the same page when the prostitute shows up here. When the drunkard shows up. When the, you fill in the blank. This is what Jesus did. He took 12 and he said, I'll let you see all the signs and wonders because they need them. You don't. You need to sit at my table for three years. Journey with me through the ups and the downs. At some point, I'm gonna look at you and say, get behind me, Satan. This isn't me. This is Jesus talking to Peter, really, Simon. You don't have the things of God in mind. You have the things of man. Simon's going, we need to stay here, man. We got more people ready to receive the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, we need to go to another city. Why? Because it's exposing all of these agendas that I don't think Simon knew he had. Oh, it's time to move here. There's something powerful about having the table set and us continuing to create space, to prioritize it, to be aware of our own journey. And here's the one for today. 
We value showing up. Now, some of you may go, oh, I know what that means, and that's awesome. But let's, I, I, there's a specific thing that I want to say because I, I got a new easel. <laughs> Peggy's not here to scare me, so that's exciting. We value showing up, showing up. So just a couple things to help us define our terms, right? When we say showing up, what we mean is being present, right? This idea that I'm showing up, and we all have had these experiences where uh, ministry comes knocking and we're not necessarily in a heart place to do it, right? Where we're like, Lord, do not send that person to me right now because I will give them the right hand of fellowship before I will do anything else. By that, I mean the fist, right? And then Jesus giggles and they show up. And then there's something that happens where like you begin to just, okay, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And there's something that thaws your heart out. Does that make sense? Like there are many times where I was in the midst of like, uh, I'll use this language, sin is trapped pain. Where I'm doing things that I know are sin, but I don't necessarily know the root of why I'm doing them, but I also don't necessarily want to stop. There were many times where I was in a season of that where I was kind of ignoring some of what Holy Spirit was saying. And then the Lord said, then all of a sudden, like I wasn't even looking for it, but an opportunity to minister would come. And then in my mind, I thought, well, I can't do that. I'm not living right with the Lord. I, I am, but it's like these gradual spaces. I don't know how to, I, mean, I wasn't, yeah. And so I found myself as I was talking, as what the Lord was having me preach was really like the things that my heart needed to hear again. I was preaching to myself right? And after that place, I found myself in deep repentance because I had forgotten how good he was. So sometimes the Lord will use ministry to awaken your heart to what's always been there, but you've forgotten. Does that make sense? Other times the Lord will say, hey, we need to deal with this and we need to deal with it right now, right? So this idea of being present, uh, it's, it's this idea of like at any given moment, there are three conversations happening, At any given moment, there are three conversations that you're being invited into. One is the conversation with the Lord, right? In Thessalonians, Paul says, pray without ceasing, right? And we're not talking about an intellectual prayer, are we? I used to do that with my high school kids, and I would say, let's let's practice being in the presence. And they would say, okay, I'm going to pray the whole time. And they're sitting in calculus class, and they come into my class the next period, and they're ticked at me. Because they're like, how am I supposed to listen to Mr. Bird talk about calculus and pray the whole time? And I, so we began to unpackage the Western idea of like, oh, you're seeing prayer as just this active, logical conversation that I'm having. That's not what it is. Like, you were created holistically. The Hebraic understanding is that your heart is engaged with the Lord at all times. To the point that there's like, he's not talking in English all the time. But there's a place where my heart is connected to him and I'm aware of what he's saying. Now, some of us are going, what is he talking about? Is this new age? It's not new age. It's biblical, right? So that's the first conversation, me and the Lord. Is my heart connected to the Lord? The second conversation is me with my own heart. Me with my own heart, right? It's this capacity to sit with someone, to, to, to just be doing life, and I'm having this conversation with the Lord, and anytime you're having that conversation with the Lord, be ready, because there's gonna be things in your own heart that are gonna jump out and start trying to argue with the Lord, Things are going to come out because the Lord's always leading you. Nothing is, nothing is coincidence. The Lord is always leading you deeper into the revelation of him. My experience, though, is because this heart conversation has not necessarily been taught real well, in, especially in the church. I have reduced my relationship with the Lord to my times of intellectual prayer, my times of intellectual study, and my times where I know exactly what God's doing, then I feel really connected to the Lord. And if we're really being honest, it's like, what, 12% of the time <laughs> where I know exactly what God's doing? And so there's this invitation of the Lord to say, I just want to abide with you. I just want to be with you. Where suddenly there's no line of sacred and secular where this is holy and this is no longer holy. Suddenly it becomes, if I'm there, it's an invitation to the sacred because he's in me. And so I'm in this conversation with him, how, you know, 
Beyond words, my heart's connected to him. But here's the other one that I don't know if in, us in the West, because we've taken the subservient role, I don't know if we're really good at, is this conversation with my own heart. Rachel gave the testimony last week of this. Uh, the water was so hot. And this beautiful place, as she was journeying this road, the Lord started, the Lord gave her a sheet of 20 emotions. And the Lord started to say, what are you feeling right now? And she had to find the emotion that she was feeling in this whole journey. And she's so modest she would never say this, but this was her journey into Holy Spirit. Right, because there's this passage in, in Matthew 5 that says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And there's, that woman's heart is so pure. She was designed to see his face. But because she's so familiar with herself, she didn't know she was seeing his face. And so as the Lord started to unlock what she was feeling and how she was connected with her own heart, she began to see power in ministry in ways she never had. He actually used that to unlock the prophetic in her. So it's powerful, right? This idea that sometimes we wanna just train you how to do the prophetic, not understanding that if mom not connected to my own heart, you know how much stuff is gonna come out? And here's the other part that's really tough is sometimes somebody's just naturally gifted in the prophetic and they can release a prophetic word. They can speak in tongues. They can do all these different things, but because they're not necessarily connected to their own heart, there's all of this shadow in there that can become grenades in people's hearts and they're unaware of it, right? And so anointing, power, authority, those things he gives, but it doesn't always correlate with like, I've done my own journey to like, limit my soul gap so I'm not, I don't have a machine gun every time I'm in a bad mood. Does that make sense? I'm speaking in hyperbole. But that's what we're talking about with the journey, is recognizing that. So that's one here, right? One here in my own journey. And there's those two, right? Because that's, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting at the table at that place, prepared a table before me and I've learned to sit at it. Then what happens is, is when you start to talk to somebody and, I, and you're actually fully, you're fully present and we don't just mean I'm here and I'm locked in mentally. I mean, I'm fully present with both of those conversations going on. I'm listening, I'm discerning and then what happens is, is if you listen long enough, people's language betrays them. And I don't mean this betrayal, I mean like it exposes Somebody starts to talk, and you might not know why. Somebody says, oh yeah, my sister did this one time, and the Holy Spirit says there's something on that. And then you get this beautiful point, much like Jesus, where you get to ask questions. Well, tell me about that. What? Tell me about your sister. And, and I cannot tell you, working at the bar, how many times I'd sit there and I'd slide a beer across the, t the, the bar top to them. And I'd say, okay, tell me. I said, who are you? Where are you from? They da -da 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 -da, and the Holy Spirit would say, ask them about that. And within 10 minutes of, and I, it wasn't, I wasn't trying to do ministry, I was just genuinely interested in people. Holy Spirit started to illuminate stuff. And sometimes I would go to like do ministry and the Lord says, I didn't tell you to do that, shut up. <laughs> so I'd go back behind the bar and I'd have a chance as I'm pouring other drinks, I would just get to pray for them, right? At all times, there's three conversations going on. Does this make sense? Yeah. So when we talk about showing up, I wanna bring those parameters in of like, that's what's happening. But so often when we forget the first two and we just try to do the third, we can, uh, God's faithful. He's faithful through all of this. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that as we're finding this language, this tends to be what Holy Spirit leads, leads us into. That he makes us aware that his presence is at all spaces. That he has, he's invited you into this journey to know him, to know yourself, to know your own needs. And then, to actually show up. And so this one might be a little different for one or two of us because for some of us, we've done that part of the journey and we have no problem showing up. I've got no problem letting you know who I am, letting you know that I'm significant and letting you know that my opinion really matters. Beautiful! I'm actually like super excited because I can learn something from that. But many of us in the church, we've had it drilled into us you're a servant, you're a servant, you're a servant, where all of a sudden me showing up isn't the, ever the priority. Does this make sense? And many times what has to happen is I first have to be convinced that, that in my own relationship with the Lord, he wants me to show up fully. I'm gonna say that again. 
for many of us, it's about sitting with him and becoming convinced that he wants me to fully show up, not just in the places where I'm productive and beneficial to other people. He wants me to fully sit with him and be seen and known. If he begins to value those places, then I can begin to value those places within myself. Does that make sense? Can you see where life and community exposes all of this? It is super easy for this one not to be a value when I'm just doing life by myself. When it's me and my cats, I can show up all I want, right? There's something about being in relationship with people where one or two things happen. One, I, <laughs> I start to study showing up. I start to study, like, what does my heart need? I start to learn who I am. I start to learn, oh, I actually have needs and my needs are valuable. And then this happens every time. And then I overdose on that. So suddenly I walk into a group and I say, I matter, love me. Right? And I go into a group and I'm looking, I need to get my needs met. And there's a beautiful sanctity to that season of the journey. It's a beautiful place that can actually balance out other people. They're like, whoa, they're powerful. Whoa. Some people are like, whoa, they're jerks. You know what I mean? That's all the process of maturation. It really is. And over the course of time, you know what Holy Spirit always does? He begins to temper that. If they'll stay open to the journey, he begins to temper that and say, I love that about you. And then you know what happens? Is this value for, for being present, for me getting to, me being me, it rises and I learn, oh my gosh, I start to overdose on it and then the Lord starts teaching me about honor. Because that has to be balanced with honor. Because honor is recognizing my influence when I come into a group and then in certain moments knowing I wanna honor somebody else's ability to show up. And when I show up, in a way that's just about me and not holding the sanctity of this group in my hands, then I will overdose on showing up because it's all about what I need. And the Lord says, that's really good, but let me teach you about the concept of honor, that it's he who loses his life finds it. Right? Now here, I know that you guys know this. I know that we, but the thing is, is this, my heart, my hope is that as we put language to this, we can begin to recognize that this is a value that we're gonna to continue to cultivate. But this is also a value where you, if you're not willing to overdose in one of the areas, if you're not willing to show your rear end, that's context, go back to the beginning of this before you make any, I'm not talking naturally. If you're not willing to, to really like expose that place, then you're not showing up. Does that make sense? in a culture built on progress, in a culture built on doing it right, in a culture that many of us grew up in where if you did it wrong, the consequences were swift and they were dire. That isn't just, oh, I projected on God. That's a social wound that you caught growing up. You need a social balm to help heal that completely. That's the beauty, the power, and I regret to say it, but unfortunately, the wounding that can happen in a church. Does that make sense? So this idea of honor is, is super interesting because it requires me to manage my own atmosphere. When we talk about showing up, we can't talk about showing up and not talk about, oh, I have a responsibility to manage my own internal atmosphere. I have a responsibility. This conversation with the Lord is of utmost importance because if I'm unaware of what's going on within me, my shadow will leak big time. And sometimes I need faithful friends that can pull me aside and say, hey, can we, talk, can we chat about this? Can we really talk about what's going on? Because it feels like you've been a little edgy lately. And I'm not, you can be edgy all you want. I want to know what's going on in your heart. And you do that more often than not, people are like, I don't know. Because that edginess is a, is, a, is a fruit of being disconnected somewhere. And so the body, the bride, is invited to help reconnect hearts again. All right, 1 Peter chapter 1. I want you guys to see this. And then we'll, we'll land the plane after this. Everybody doing okay? We having fun yet? Want to get saved again? Okay. 
So I'm going to jump in. I'm going to violate a little bit of my own principles about context, but um, I uh, First Peter chapter one. He's talking about this. Oh, yeah, so good. We're going to start in verse ten. So he's kind of used the first nine verses to to give a context of salvation, and then he says, "Mine's the New King James Version." He says, "Of this salvation." Of this being warmed up, the prophets have inquired and they've searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Verse 11, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. We track him? Talking about these prophets of old. The writers of old, they, they felt the Spirit awaken them, warm them up, and they began to talk about there is coming a season when the Spirit would do that to all mankind, right? Verse 12, he says, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering things. So think about what he's saying there. The prophets of old, who their hearts were awakened, it, to them, what they recognized is they were speaking to their context that they were not ministering to their context. They were ministering to a future date that God back in 500 BC was actually ministering to a future date of people that would be so, that would have the capacity to be so intimate with him that the prophets were saying, this is what life in the spirit is like. He was aiming their attention forward. But to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. Think about this. You are the promised generation. You are the generation of resurrection. You are the ones that Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel were talking about a time when the Spirit would come. Joel said, and their their, uh, old men will dream dreams and young men will prophesy. They were talking about this generation to the point that angels, the created beings sent to minister to the people of God, angels lean over the banister of heaven and are watching what you have access to. They fear to tread on the very things because they don't know God like you do. They don't have that access. They are the servants. We are the lovers. But how often we change those roles. I don't matter. Forsaking, literally reducing the very thing that Jesus came to do to awaken and to warm up hearts to know that they are the beloved of God. This is Peter, who knows the shadow better than anybody. Verse 11, or 13, I'm sorry. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's talking to a group of people already saved. Therefore, church, gird up the loins of your mind. Lock it in here. See what I'm talking about. Be sober-minded in this. Ready? Rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What's he saying? So when you said yes to Jesus, you already got it all, right? There's no lack in you. But what we don't have are the keys that unlock the revelation where the image that he's already put in me can come fully alive. Does this make sense? So there's still shadow, if you will. So what is he saying? That what is Jesus doing? Jesus is literally through the work of the Spirit, leading you into all truth that the revelation would unlock something in you that you maybe knew in theory, but you hadn't yet met. Rest your hope that Jesus is unlocking the very revelation he put into you the moment he died and was resurrected. Come on, that'll preach. 14, ready? (laughs) As obedient children... 
not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. Now here's where it's fun, you ready? So this idea, right? Uh, In verse 13, he says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I want to be careful here. So what happens is, is that when I'm standing in the cold like this, and I'm not being warmed by the fire, my hope can only go to a future tense. That's all it can go to. Is one day we get to heaven, we're going to see this. But those that are standing by the fire and being warned by the fire, they recognize that that may be the culmination of what God's doing, but I am full, he is fully present here. Don't get caught in a future tense reality that is made for today. Does this make sense? Now here's the thing. Uh, In verse 14, does does your guys' translation have obedient children? Does anybody have anything different? Okay, can we... uh, uh, Okay, the word obedient in the Greek is the word um, upakau, right? Super easy to say, upakau, right? And it's, it's a compound word, upo, right? Meaning under, under, right? As in under the influence of, and akao, which means to hear. So the word obedient literally means being under the influence of what you hear. Fascinating wordplay here, right? So what's he say here? So your, your accurate hearing of what the Father is saying is what distinguishes you as the resurrection generation. Let me see, I'm gonna read that here. As obedient children, what's he saying? Not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, right? So to hear accurately the name, the story, the journey spoken over your life the ones that the angels know about, but they fear to tread on because they don't want to outdo the timing of the Lord. When you can hear that because you've been warmed and your heart's connected, obedience becomes the fruit of your life rather than it's something that I'm working my tail off to get to. So the very word obedient means to be under the influence of that which you hear. When I am freezing cold, it is easy to hear the distorted voice of the enemy. Because many times it's all the other people that are cold are saying the same thing. The word that Jesus died for, the story, the journey over your life, the word that he literally gave his life for, what it does is it exposes every place that the former lusts of your life were trying to get you to blind yourself to the story to. It exposes every place where the former lusts were distortions of your original design. I'm gonna say it again. Jesus literally gave his life that you would hear the authentic story. The former lusts are the the, the very things aimed at robbing you of that story. Does that make sense? Whether it be the woundings, whether it be the trauma, whether it be the whatever, fill in the blank. Verse 15, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. So think about this. So the verse 15, right? Or 14, I'm sorry, 15. But, he, but as he who called you is holy. So the one whose idea you were to begin with, right? The want you were literally birthed out of the Father. That's why he can put you back into place so easily. You were birthed out of him. The one, you were, you were his original idea. He designed you to radiate the image of his likeness. He called you to be holy. The word called there is the Greek word kaleo, and it means to be called by your name. And most of us grew up when we got called by our full name. Not a good thing. But in a different context, it is, why did they call you by your full name? You were made for more than what you're doing. And so the Father who calls you by your name beckons you that in the deepest walks of your life, you would be whole, W-H-O-L-E. 
because holiness is rooted in your wholeness in this life. So can we say for just a second, when we talk about holiness is rooted in your morality, it's a reduction of everything that God is doing. So when we talk about this space, what do we value? It's recognizing the the mystery that you carry to the point that to reduce you to just your behavioral acts. I want to pause here because the behavioral acts can expose there's some there's some twisted stuff in here. So we are not saying that sin doesn't matter. I, I really feel important that you need to know my heart on this. Sin is literally robbing you of the destiny and the glory over your life. But what happens is, is it's when, when I'm disconnected from my own heart, it's much easier to see the sins of somebody else's journey that are popping up in the natural because I'm not tempted by the same things. I've done my journey. I did my thing. And so I'm trying to correct the fruit in your tree without connecting the fact that your fruit is connected to a root system that the Lord's going after. Make sense? And he says in verse 16, and he who called you, I'm gonna change this not because I, I think holy is wrong, I think there's connotations we've attached to holiness. He who has called you to be whole, you also be whole in all of your conduct. Why? Because it has been written, be holy for I am holy. Because the prophets of old, the spirit illuminated even back then, the message was the same. You were designed to live in wholeness and walk out the radiant, glorious image of the one who made you. We value the space to hear that voice again. We value the fact that you're not gonna wake up tomorrow and be fully at the destination. How boring would that be? We value that you find yourself in the midst of some, some shadows But we know that as we journey with you, the more aware you become of the language of the lover over your life, the more confident you will become in showing up fully. In showing up saying, I don't have it all figured out and that's okay. But man, I want to come alive. I want my heart to come alive in a new way. And how many of you guys know when we we kill, you know, when we make mountains out of molehills, we kill the rabbit with a cannon, right? Many times it exposes our own insecurity about holiness. That holiness is something that you have to strive for externally. There is participation with the, the Spirit of God. I'm not saying there's not. I'm not saying we're passive in this. But we have overdosed. We've fallen off the horse one way of, it's up to me to make it happen. And the Lord's calling us back to the fire to say, no, 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 child, you're showing up has little to do with what you can strive for on your own. You're showing up is, is, is letting me warm you up again because it's already there. And when you hear my, the voice of the lover speak over you, it's gonna come alive. That's the nature of be holy as I am holy. God himself is dwelling within you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for letting me uh, pontificate and uh, this is a section that I, I saw um, this is out of Isaiah 53. You guys, it's a real famous passage. I'm going to do this for communion today. He's talking about the suffering servant and he says, surely he has borne our griefs or our sicknesses. He's carried our sorrows or our pains. Ready? And there's this phrase that says, you guys need, nice, that's right, fan of white right there. So if you, if you have your Bible, it's, it's in Isaiah 53, in verse 4, he says, Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Right? And so what he's saying here is this interesting thing in the Hebrew where he's saying, Surely he came and he carried our, our, he carried our griefs, and he, or I'm sorry, he bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows. He took our sicknesses and our pains, right? And yet we said, oh, he's been stricken by God. But that's not actually what happened, right? Because the Father was fully on that cross as much as Jesus was. But 
He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So the question becomes, and I'm going to read this because I felt like it was really appropriate from Jesus. Who originated the cross? Either it originated in God, which makes him the cosmic abuser, or it originated in us as humanity. The deviant device of the cross is the cosmic, it's the, it's the iconic manifestation of our blind commitment to darkness. I'm gonna say that again. The cross stands as the iconic manifestation of humanity's blind commitment to darkness. It's literally our ultimate desecration of the goodness and loving intent of God to create. God gave life. God's loving intent to create is focused on human creation. And so the cross becomes our, the darkness within us, it becomes our ultimate fist raised to God. And yet in the midst of that, how does God respond? God responds to the ultimate picture of our cruelty and our attempt to steal life, and he submits to it. God willingly climbed on to our torture device, and he met us at the deepest and the darkest place, the place of our diabolical imprisonment to our own lies. And by submitting once and for all, God destroyed its power. Jesus is God's best, given freely and willingly in direct opposition to your very worst, represented in the cross. Even to the point that in Revelation 13, it says that Jesus was sacrificed before the foundation of the world. So when God created, he understood the implications of what was going to happen that his own children, the highest order of his creation, would one day make the final attempt to kill life. So Isaiah 53 prophesies the future, that although he bears our sins and and he suffers at our hands, we considered, oh, this is God punishing him. But it's actually in Jesus that God encountered and embraced the depths of our twisted rebellion and our brokenness. It's in the cross that the logical conclusion to our rebellion is fully embraced. This is Jesus, God submitting to our torture machine and transforming it into an icon and a monument of grace. So precious to us that we wear it on rings or around our necks. This torture device declares that there is nothing I can bring to the table that is so evil or so broken that God won't climb into it with me. There's nothing so dead that God is incapable of growing in it something living. The cross, once our greatest attempt at destroying life, has become our most precious symbol of the God who is hope for us all. So in the name of Jesus, Lord, on the night that you were betrayed, you took the bread and you broke it. You said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus. Jesus, the darkest places within each of us that cause us to want to hide, you have taken on yourself and bore light. And he took the cup, and he said, this is wine of my presence. Yeah. (laughs) The wine of my presence, pour it out for you, do this in remembrance of me.
Yeah, and so Jesus, we just sit in the mystery that is your body and your blood. That the darkest places, Lord, that uh, cause us to step out of the journey, to step out of, of, of what you're doing within us, the glory that has been housed within these clay vessels. The places where our eyes look to the right and to the left. You took that darkness and you covered it with light. You took our greatest attempt at a, a fist raised to you and you made it a monument of grace. And I just declare that in this group, with these people, Holy Spirit, you are doing the same thing. The depths of wounds, the depths of places, Lord, where we have been victims to our own journeys and our own stories, you are literally making them monuments of grace. And I declare in the name of King Jesus that the deepest places of wounding that have happened in this room, the deepest place of hurts, we declare that it is, those are the colors and the vibrancy of the painting that he is creating. We declare in the name of Jesus that each one of us does our journey to go deeper and to trust more that your heart is good for us, Lord. You are creating a tapestry that the world has not yet seen. And so I ask in the name of Jesus for courage for each one of us. The joy that you set before us, Lord, is that we would see within our story, within our journey, fully manifested in the community around us, the fingerprints of grace. That everything the enemy intended for evil, you would require sevenfold payment in the name of Jesus. Any places, Father, where hopelessness has reigned, we declare the kingdom of God. Yeah, we declare in the name of Jesus that you are beckoning us to step forward and to show up in new ways. We love you, we love you, we love you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen, amen. All right, my friends, we'll see you next week. Blessings to you. Be waiting for another, uh, I think Wednesdays we're gonna do, Kimmy's gonna do announcements. And so uh, we're excited about that. And uh, once again, if you need any uh, logistical stuff, uh, Kim's your girl. Um, if it's about small group stuff, I would love to chat with you about it. Um, but yeah, have a great week. Blessings to you.